Hey everyone, and welcome to another episode of Broken by Concept, episode 192. Today we are diving into two topics, and they're kind of joined together, GeoQ being one of them, and communication. Mm, communication sort of, is all the sort of bounce off the GeoQ topic, yeah. That's right. And I want to kick it off more so with the GeoQ, and then we'll ease into the communication aspect, all right? GeoQ, a very controversial topic, you know... Um, if you're a long-term BBC listener, you probably already have a rough idea on our stance. But I think it war- it's such an important topic, I think. We get this question a lot. I think it warrants an episode within itself. I want to start by setting the scene here, Nathan, using a, a, an analogy. To really love get love analogies here. Set the scene. Where are we at? What the hell is GeoQ? Okay. Actually, before we even dive into this analogy, the way me and you, when we hear GeoQ, right, it goes through our ears and we, we process this, this little state, this little sentence. GeoQ, what is this? We don't think of it in terms of, all right, go into a game and win a game. Like we, we think, it, we don't even think about it in terms of going into the game and playing with someone else. I think what our mind jumps to immediately is you are now, this is a very complicated, you're really complicating the learning from the game, like from a learning perspective. We, 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 we tunnel vision hardcore in the learning because when we think about League of Legends, we think about your journey holistically. We don't really... We, t- we tend to think big picture, more long-term when it comes to league. We don't think of what's going to lead to success in this one game or this one block. What's going to work for you? What's going to be beneficial for you in the wide majority of games? So we think of, okay, well, GeoQ, that's going to be a very messy, you know, complicated learning experience. Okay, now the analogy that I think exemplifies this is I want to take a trip down memory lane here. Back to, might be university, might be high school. A shared project at Ooh, school. People have lots of experience with shared projects in their education days. That's right. So let's take, you know, maybe you're in, you're in high school and you got an assignment, a project. A maybe, group project, right? A group project, yeah. right? Let's say it could be a science project. You and your buddy, you get put up in pairs of two. It's all right, you two are together and you guys are going to study this topic and you're going to do, a, present a, do some project on... I don't know. It could be anything. Uh, let's just say you got to figure out how this, you got to study this to- this uh, mineral or whatever the hell it is in science. I don't know. And so you get paired up and you're like, all right, yeah, let's tackle this one together. And you got to try and figure out how to get the best possible grades while collaborating with your partner. Now, I'm sure many of you have had probably some positive experiences. You get paired up with someone that you enjoy working with, maybe a friend and, 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 or maybe you get paired up with someone that's really smart the and they can in the carry class. You. Yeah. <laughs> someone who's just like, oh, yes, I got the nerd. Like, or you're like, oh, I got paired with the person that just never doesn't does give a no shit. work. Yeah. doesn't even want to be there. doesn't even want to be there. Right. Yeah. And which you know that you're going to have to do everything. Right. Mm. And so, it's a very, it's a bit of an interesting situation, right? Immediately off the bat, you don't you know that it can be either a, a you know it could be a relatively positive experience, or it could be a very negative experience, or it could be just a mediocre mediocre experience. Now, the reason I like this analogy is it's quite complicated because I, I, let's go dive. I want to really dive deep into this. I want to look at it through the lens of it is fundamentally a shared learning environment. You know, entering a shared learning environment. It's not just about me and the learning here and what I'm going to get out of this. It's about, you know, my partner as well in, in doing this project. Now, there are situations in which, you know, you work really well with your partner. You can collaborate really well. You can communicate really well with your partner. And you can actually, you know, kind of be greater than the sum of the parts. Like one plus one equals three. You might have... Um, a better, better efficient workflow. You can create a you know, time, better quality product, better even quality if you were to do it by yourself, because maybe they know things that you don't know, different, you know perspective. things, different perspectives, you can have great communication. You can, you can genuinely maybe even learn more than you would have otherwise by yourself. And this is because again, maybe the personalities work well together. Maybe you, again, you have some sort of relationship before that. You can really riff off that. Maybe you have, you have aligned values and which you both want to get the maximum grade. Right. If you have alignment in the way you want to go about the project, even the way you work, how often you work, how much effort you want to put in, then it can be a pretty awesome experience. Right. That could be good not only for your learning, but actually the end result, which you're going to be able to produce. But on the flip side, imagine if we don't have alignment. What happens if you get you're with someone that doesn't give a shit? Maybe they're actually maybe they don't really care about the grade too much. Maybe um, you have differing perspectives on the topic itself. Maybe you're not aligned on the actual topic. Maybe you can't get aligned. Maybe the way you communicate and the way you fundamentally work together or enjoy working or tend to tend to work is just fundamentally different. 
you can see where I'm going here. We're in duo queue, depending on, you know, the type of person or the person that you are duo in queue with. It could be of either a very positive experience or a very negative experience. And that's just one of the, the many, many complexities that we're going to explore here. And, and, and I guess where I want to start here is that let's talk about the complexities of working with another individual, the complexities with collaborating with another individual. I want to start there and then we'll go a little bit deeper. So you don't want to start... Actually, the, the interpersonal dynamics or, do, or are you talking more about, we'll go into the actual game, how it affects in the game itself later. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah exactly. Okay. Exactly. All right. Let's talk about the challenges of just working with another individual. Okay. I mean, okay, I'll just start to get the ball rolling. The first one is... Well, the reality is that we're not two pieces of AI. We're not two robots. So I, I might do something in the game or I might say something that could potentially trigger you, right? I might say something like, um, oh man, the jungle, is so, the jungle is so active on the map. So I'm, sure, man, so I'm a mid laner and I'm doing my jungle. Oh, oh so like passive aggressive statements. I'm like just saying, I'm just saying an idea. Maybe, yeah, okay. Right, this is one of the challenges. Yeah. I mean, you, we're working with, a, with someone, right? They're going to hear you and you're going to be communicating with them. Um, and, and again, we face this in our, in our, uh, competitive days back in the day. What if I say in the game, oh, Shaco came mid again. Now that could be a very harmless comment, right? I might say that and in the game that might, I might, I might not mean anything bad by it, but you say we're joined together. You hear that, that could piss you off. It's like, well, what does he want? He just got game. He, he misplayed. What is he talking about? Or you might say, oh, why does the mid have so much prior? Oh, the mid has prior again. Here we go. You know, you might say some offhanded comment that could potentially trigger me or create or create some sort of like a negative situation without even you realizing it. Now, obviously, again, if we're aligned and we have a really good relationship and I'm not afraid of conflict, I could actually go in there and I could say, hey, Nathan, can you shut the fuck up? Mm -hmm. I don't want to hear that. Just tell me what, let's get specific here. Or I could tell you how I want you to communicate or what I don't want to hear from you. But the reality is how often, how many emails do we get from the BBC about, oh yeah, I don't know how to approach my friend when he says this. He gets angry, <laughs> yeah. I don't know what to do. I just sit silent there. And I just, yeah. It makes me feel do? uncomfortable. It makes me feel uncomfortable. Yeah. I don't know. I don't, I, I can't <clears throat> confront him. So other problems will be like misunderstanding of like what they may be meant in that situation. That's very common in competitive. Different straight up views of how to win the game. Like this is the way I think you win this game. And in a fast paced game like League, you don't really have time to sit back and have that, you know, that conversation or you review, you know, that's for the review. Uh, so again, these are more specific game ones. Mental baggage, past experiences. Yeah. Right. You might have uh, an idea of what you expect from that person, but, and then maybe, or maybe past Yeah, experience. someone not meeting expectations. Someone not meeting expectations. Yeah. Maybe you have expectations about their level of intensity or their level of effort. Maybe you're doing a lot of your personal reviews, but you don't feel like they're doing their personal reviews and they're not getting, you know. Or like I, they're playing champs that they don't main. Yeah. Maybe they they don't. Yeah. I mean, that's just one of the, yeah, exactly. So I think what I'm trying to get across here is that there's a lot of invisible under the surface, messy interpersonal things that are at play here. Mm. Okay. Just like there would be in a school project. So yeah, you're saying humans complex. Humans are complicated. There's and, shit there. And it's important to note that that exists. Yeah. That is real and that exists. And it's important- we cannot overlook that. It's statement. not the sunshine and rainbows that people think. It's like, oh, cool. I'm just going to be, and we're just like the best friends. And like, when you're going and get going in, like, even you would say that like the most famous like duos of like competitive stuff like that, like there's big conflicts in competitive. Yeah, we just don't league. see it. You just don't see it. Just it don't looks see all good from the happies from the outside, but it's complicated. Because when we think of duo we think of like, the stars align, champions <laughs> yeah. are aligned, our views are aligned, our communication is flawless. We get into review together. It's all, we're winning games. We're, we're, you know, it's all going well. But what happens when it doesn't go well? Mm. Again, th there's the complexity of what happens when you start losing games. How, how does one person deal with adversity? What if one person vents? What if one person gets really tilted? How are you going to handle that? What are you going to do? You're going to just not enjoy the next game? You're going to play solo the next game? You've been enjoyed it solo, then enjoy it solo? What are you going to do? Mm. Does one person believe in three blocks and the other person does believe in three blocks? Uh, doesn't? I don't know. Let's say, yeah, again, going into their own personal one. And maybe it's like, I don't want you to talk about my lane phase here. Let me just, I want to figure this out by myself. Even a lack of alignment, even in the, the review process itself. Maybe mm. some person, one person doesn't believe in reviewing the first eight minutes. But he just wants to go over the major team fights. Maybe someone, again, maybe that guy's at a different stage of his journey. Maybe he has refined his early lane, but he's messing up in there. He doesn't even want to get into that early game stuff. Yeah, it's just pointless to talk about. That's the other thing I was going to mention is that it just depends as well where people are in their league journey. Duo Q for 
uh, two pro players would look much different from Joku of like just two gold players or, right. or, or diamond plus players. Because there is less... Re- we actually spoke about this on another episode, Nathan, where the lower elo you are, the more reasons you could be at that rank. Whereas the higher elo you are, the less reasons you could be at that rank. Mm. There's less variables that you haven't covered. Right, we can all agree. If you're two challenger level players, you you're probably going to be at a. You know, we all know at least what you hundred percent know. You must know. You have you a pretty know. good game sense. There's not many ways to get to challenge. <laughs> yeah. like, there's not many ways to get to challenger. Yeah. There's a lot of ways to be gold. Yes. Um. Okay. So there's that. That's that element of the whole package, right? Okay. Going back to the project there. Okay. Now I want to talk about optimizing for short term versus optimizing for long term now in the case of a project right it's just one project right you're going to collaborate with that for, for that with that uh, partner for one project so you don't really need to be too concerned about okay uh, maybe my partner's shit or maybe this doesn't work out um it's just it's just one project i don't really give a shit it's not like we're going to be studying this topic again we're just going to be doing this one topic and then moving on and so you know let's say you you work with them and it works out well great whatever you get a good grade you don't feel you don't feel like you've sabotaged your own learning journey at all even if it goes poorly because it's just it's a one-off it's just one project when it comes to league we must think long term right because what matters in in league is our underlying learning the learning that we take from each and every game Whereas, um, whereas in school, a lot of the time you do it, it's like you do a project on volcanoes or some shit, you know, what you do in high school, it's Mm -hmm. like, (laughs) whatever the hell it is, you learn that type and then you just move on. It's like, we're not, we're not going to visit volcanoes 2.0 in a year from now. You know what I mean? Like, whereas in, in league, everything that you learn is a personal journey and you're going to be following, like evolving that learning over and over and over again. You see what, you kind of see what I mean? I want to work on this analogy a bit more because I'm trying mm. to... The difference between like a group project mm. and like duo queuing mm. is that duo queue is like a agreement. like, we want to do this. We're going mm. into this together. Mm. But a group project is more so like you just get thrown you together to and you're like, choosing your partner. You're choo- right. I see you know what I mean? So well, that's you can, like a big you difference. Might, there might be scenarios where you do choose your partner in a group project though, right? I mean, they might say, all right, that's you guys pro- go with yeah. me. But you have to be... I mean, you can't go solo. You would want, you might want to do a solo, but you have to do duo, in, in, in duo project. Well, let's I mean? say that you get this group projects though. It's like, well, that's is it, everyone to. has to do a group yeah, yeah, but yeah, you don't yeah, have yeah. to do it. So that's, I think, a, a part there of the analogy. There is an element of that. Okay. The, yeah. Because I, 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 I wanna... again, the, the way people think about duo Curtis, just really simply mm. put, is I have a higher chance of winning LP in the short term. Like, let's just... In the short that, term. That's, that's my the point. Elephant so that's, what I want, that's what I wanted to kind of touch on in a weird way is that when it comes to duo Q, Okay, we got to get get aligned. Are we optimizing for the short term or the long or the long term? Okay, so when it comes to duo queue, in my opinion, there's only one way of kind of effectively doing it. Is that if you're going to duo, you got to duo all the time. You got to commit to that partner. It's like we're going long. We're going deep. Yeah, we're going to duo all the time. We're going to go live and die. We're going to yeah live and die by (laughs) each other, and we are going to go on this shared learning journey. For we're going to hold hands and go through this learning journey together. Right, and the reason for that is that you can actually develop your own unique toolkit to review, and actually learn as as a group. Right, but if you're doing with like a, a friend and you do that for two days or three days or a week, you know what I mean? Like you, you can't go from duo queue to solo queue. It, it it doesn't work like that because you're it really ruins the learning journey. Yeah, you're not getting anywhere. You're not getting anywhere. You, you, you duo with the new person every two weeks and you play a week with solo. It, it, it doesn't make sense. No. Because the, the learning when you're duo it's 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 very, very different to how you're going to learn in a solo environment, right? It, again, just tying back to the project. If you're doing a solo project, the environment in which you complete that project and the way you go about it, everything is going to be very different if you have to collaborate with someone. Now, um, and then again, let's go back to the toolkit, right? The toolkit in, for duo queuing, if you were going to make duo queue work, Nathan, what would it be? If you had to duo queue, God, if what I was going to make it work. So this is really hard for me, Curtis. Again, people saying that, you know, people that know our stance, hmm. like that statement of the idea of the outcome with two people can hmm. be greater than one. Hmm. For a the ranked journey, I fundamentally believe the outcome is significantly worse when you're working with other people. You have to 
work by yourself. Right. It's way more efficient, actually. Okay, that so way. let's then so then let's get into the challenges then. Okay. What are the challenges then in Duo Q in your mind? The challenges in Duo Q. What are the challenges? Major challenges of, of Duo Q. Um see this is where I think we need to break it down for like rank and role. Okay. So I feel like that a jungler has significantly different challenges than the duo queue of like a bot lane, okay. right? Like, so let me talk from a jungler's perspective here, Curtis, because, you know, I'm a jungle coach and I've seen an unbelievable amount of students come into my program that their relationship with the game is completely ruined from duo queue. Mm. Their way of how they think about the game, how to win games is very distorted. Jungle position, Curtis. <laughs> Unless you're a jungler or you have a very high level understanding of the game, it's very difficult to understand what a jungler wants. Like if let's say a, a goal player, what, what do they think about a jungler? They think that a jungler comes to my lane and then like I'm just getting targeted or they don't see that, that the jungler might be losing options or being inefficient. Like people have a very binary view and, and junglers hate this where they're getting dragged to a gank that they're going to and then they're skipping camps for it, right? And then the gank doesn't go well and they don't they know it doesn't go well. Right. So that's a huge part of what Okay, I wanna even go Yeah. So I, I, I totally get you. But I think you we're assuming that yeah, we need to st- clarify why you believe that, right? So correct me if I'm wrong. You believe that <clears throat> especially as a jungler people from other roles, I'm assuming you're meaning lower ELO brackets or every ELO No, bracket? I mean, they turn, even in Master. Okay, master, even, let's, yeah. let's, let's just say Master below then. Let's yeah. just, let's ignore GM. The and general people. player base has a very poor misunderstanding of what a jungle What a jungle role wants. is. What, what it is, what, what it is wants. What is the jungle role and what is a jungle role? What a high percentage plays for right. a jungler. So, so when you're, so, so basically the, the, the main problem with that is that when you're getting into a game and then your duo partner is trying to make decisions, they're not factoring in how what you want what you want yes. they're, 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 yeah they're only thinking about what they want they're very bad at putting yourself in the shoes of a jungler and the jungler gets destroyed in in competitive competitive we've seen many history of junglers that mm. their careers get ruined quick because they get re- lose a lot of confidence mm. from coaches or other laners in their in their in their team other pro players and just for the communication as well like you know, just think about your duo saying, come camp my lane. Like, what does that mean? That means nothing to me. Yeah. Like, that, that's not specific at all. It's not how the game works. Yeah. That's fairyland. Um, there's so many elements to what a good gank is. It's like, what's my win condition? Well, if I show on the map, what do I lose? Can I gank right and now? I see it all the how time in my gold? reviews. You would see it in mid lane where as well. You, the, they, they ping for assistance mid. I'm like, this is game losing. There you go. They're not even duo queue. In they're that not point. even duo queue and yeah. they're ping for assistance. You will lose the game from calling so the play. But, but again, this is where I think short term versus long term, right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jab back. I, I want this actually, this is interesting. Let's make this theme of this. You're against and I'm for, just for the sake okay, of the argument. Right, yeah. And then and then we'll try to like, right. you know, get into it, right? Yeah, let's keep just attacking this. Let's keep this. attacking. I want to keep attacking it. Because there's so many different ways so to go. So many things We haven't really talked, I mean, we're, we're touching on communication a little bit here, Curtis, but yeah, like now you're I mean, We're opening a can of worms here. Okay? The, the so, challenges. so what you just said there is that, okay, let's say that person did. Let's say, let's say for example, you had a duo, uh, uh, let's say um, you had a duo, you know, two people drawing in diamond, right? And then, and then it was a mid jungle, and and then that mid and jungle had obviously a lot of painful experiences because the mid was calling for terrible ganks, and the jungle's like, "What the fuck?" You know, I can't gank here. And then obviously they would have had to get into the review, and the jungler's having to educate the mid laner, like, "I can't be here, and this is why." Or the case where they're not educated because they feel that they can't have that conversation, they just drag to it, and then you get that's what that's happens. where the incident person that's shit when comes you get play. so bad, and then you might just spite that person because you're like, "Well, this isn't working." I don't, I, they might not even know why it's not working. So, so, so your point is that. That's it's not it's just it's just fairyland to assume that a a a a, a duo could even get into that discussion and the jungle could try to describe to the mid laner why this is a terrible play because it like okay let me read this statement so mm. from my experience people have a very large misunderstanding of the jungle role what the jungler wants but overall no one knows what each other wants from yes, all roles that's correct all right so yep. so that's but jungles on the extreme because junglers can ruin games really quick because you're the x factor you're the quarterback in the game like you're the one that's especially in the early game if you show on the map that changes the game but people are gonna the argument are gonna say in the in the chat they're gonna say but but aren't this person's not gonna know what any other one anyone wants anyway whether you're Jorky or not. Yeah. 
and and the re- and I and and the, but again, just I'm going to be on your side for a second. The reason that doesn't matter as much is because you're you're limited as to how you can influence those people. But when you're duo queue and you're on comms and you're talking with someone, you influence that person oh, way more yeah, yeah. for two reasons. Obviously, there is the voice, but also number two, there's a relationship there. Yeah. So that you trust they yeah. they they they're going to give your what you say more weight. But if some idiot in solo queue starts pinging you to assist, essentially, you don't give a fuck what they say. You're just going to mute them and move on, right? I do that all the time. Someone instantly pings me. I know that's a terrible way. Insta mute. Hmm. There's zero, there's nothing, there's no connection between me and that guy. But if that's someone, maybe like we're enjoying, you're saying, Curtis, you need to come, but you need to come. I'm like, I'm going to start doubting myself. Like, fuck, like, if Nathan's thinking this shit, you know. And I, especially I'll, if he's saying it in a way that's like, this is going to win us the game. Exactly. And then also, this is where personality types come into play. Obviously, for me, you know, for us, you know, we're not afraid of, you know, holding our ground if we were in that situation. But a lot of people wouldn't have that confidence or maybe a belief in their own level of play. Or maybe they don't even just, they're not at a good level of their own. They don't believe they're good enough at the game. They're just going to think that they know better. It goes even further that, Curtis, though. If you want to be a good League of Legends player, you need to be as a jungler. You need to be aware of everything that's going on the map. And that's your job, your role. Challenger player knows instantly yeah. whether that's going to be a good play or not. Without, like, you have to get to that point. Otherwise, that's what we're trying to chase. That's what we're trying to chase. Is a jungler. So, and this is, again, where our communication in, in, in League is super, misunderstood misrepresented because if I if I have to communicate to you this is for gank specific that this I need to gank this and the jungler wasn't able to pick that up themselves that's their review that's over. the end of review for the, the jungler the fact that they and have the to reason this is that. the case because league moves too fast right that's the main reason League me moves slow, like in a way, like things mm. are quite binary, especially mm. in the early stages. Mm. Like this is either gankable or it's so not. You're, so, so you're saying that the jungler, sh- I mean, the- yeah. So it moves fast, but it moves slow. Like that's sort of the way League works. Like, it's like you're walking around the map slowly, collecting mm. information. Mm. Uh, but if you're at stuck on one side of the map, then you're just stuck there for it. You know, right. you know what I mean? Yeah. No, I totally get you. Like you want to get to the point as a jungler where nothing's. You already know exactly what you should and shouldn't do. And no one needs to give you any and then information. You're, you're just choosing what you prioritize. You're like, okay, I understand everything was happening on the map here. Given this information, I chose this versus yeah. I am going to this because someone's telling me going to this. And it can't. The league does will never work well that way. And objectively, right? People may say, well, okay, what if what if my information is giving me what if my jaw is giving me correct information so I can make decisions faster? But again, the thing is, is Yes, like theoretically, like theoretically, if that Joku, you, you were like completely aligned, you were both very high level players, you, you know, they, they give you information that they know that you wouldn't have been able to process. It's like in, incredibly refined, then sure. But even then, an argument could be made, well, it'd be better for that person not to have that information so that he can have that painful experience so he could actually learn that for himself is... That's kind of what we believe, right? That's right. Yeah. And let's just also distinguish as well. We're not talking about pro play communication here. We're separating that from average solo queue experience solo and queue. learning the game. Even up to, you know, master, grandmaster plus. Yep. The learning journey is significantly more efficient and productive solo. Because this is my point. This is where, I, again, I know a bit of, I was a bit lost the plot with the project analogy, but that's where I'm trying to get to where in solo queue, we fundamentally, the only thing we should really care about in solo queue is optimizing for our learning. Cause that's what's going to lead to rank, right? Our, the learning we take from each and every game, not the result of one game. Exactly right. Right. Whereas in a project, you don't give a fuck, you know, you don't, you don't care. It's not really, yeah, you are learning things, but you don't, you just want to get the best grade for that project and then move on. You know, that's where it's, it's a completely different environment. That's where the analogy kind of yeah, breaks so down. It's, it's, it's now so, breaking down. It's good that we started with the analogy then we sort of broke yeah. it down a little bit how it's, that's, that's just where the it's reality different. of where Duoq. Again, yeah. that's why Duoq, so, so again, the, the, the theme of this where I want to, again, explore is Duoq is a, is essentially a shared learning environment. And, and what I want to, what we want to need to explore here today are the complexities and challenges yes. of a shared learning environment. And so we've already touched on the interpersonal stuff. You've now spoken a little bit about, about how the, in a, in a duo situation, many people from a jungler's perspective, other roles don't really understand what you want. So if they don't understand what you want, if they can't see the game through your lens, then they're just going to be a distraction, right? They're just going to give you wrong information. They're going to d- d- basically uh, be a detriment yeah. to, so, to your decision. People have been saying, like, I'm really good at seeing the game from their lens. That I don't, we don't really mean it's like 
I'm like empathetic to them. It's it's about like your skill level and your knowledge. Like your knowledge. unless you play that role or you understand that champion or you're a very high level player, it's very difficult to know what they want in that moment. And the what great teamwork communication is in league is when everyone knows what each other wants. Wink and, each, and there's so many aspects of that, you know, like item spikes, you know, le- there's so much game knowledge in terms of that. Um, that has to be there for there ever to be yeah. that idea of, I understand what they want. Okay. Okay. So let's go back then to your four, uh, you're against, I'm four. So let's go through another challenge, right? Actually, let's go, let's actually go through the roles. So you're yeah. saying jungle. Let's yeah, go so through the different jungle. roles. So let's say bot lane, right? That's a, a very cool. No, let's do the solo laners first, Curtis. Okay. So you okay. want to go top, Just top mid? Just really quick here, top mid. Hmm. League of Legends in top mid is a solo game hmm. for the first 10 minutes of the game. 15, yeah. oh, like nine. more or less. Well, nine. it depends. Mid and top are different, I think. Mid's like you're basically in the isolated one for like first eight minutes and then post eight minutes, then it's kind of sketchy. But yep. top's like different. I think you're in a solo lane for a long time. So, maybe 15 minutes. So we know. need to establish that fact. It's a right. pure solo game. Let's say, for example, you might be a jungler. You might be giving information where the enemy jungler is. Yeah, that might be helpful, but that's something that you should have a good idea. Okay, I'm just gonna. I'll speak. I'm the mid laner here, right? So from mid laner's perspective, right? Um, you know, look objectively, it would be helpful to have a jungler saying, "Okay, I'm gonna, I want to contest these grubs or whatever it is," and they give you heaps of warning and they give you information about what they what they're gonna do, right? That might change how you reset or play. Yeah, it might change how I reset stuff. That, That that is objectively true, but. Again, a very high level mid laner should already be kind of preparing or have a pretty good hunch. It's like, we have a stronger top side. I should probably be wanting grubs anyway. Like the level the, the level you want to get to as a mid laner is that it's like, okay, I had a review today, right? Where it was a, he was playing Trinity mid, which is weird, but he was playing Trinity mid and he had a, a Rumble top into a Teemo and Rumble's getting a shit ton of prior. I think Solo killed Teemo early and I think he had a Silas jungle. They had just a way stronger like top side 3v3. And so what I said, I, I literally said this, I said, you got to get a base at around 4.30 so you can get back on the map and then we want to be doing grubs on spawn. Like, You don't need a duo to tell you that. that. That's no, objectively that's game the correct knowledge. play. That's objectively the correct yes. play. Now, yes, that person would have made a better decision in that game if he was duo with the jungler and the silent said, I want grubs on spawn. But does that mean, yeah, sure, we're again optimizing for that one game. But again... That Trinity long term, there's no lane. And what that Trinity did instead, what he look what he did. Instead he stayed, yeah. he elongated the lane, yeah. greeted for a freeze, froze under his tower, his Silas went on to grubs, and then they had the they lost grubs. I said, This is why you reset a four thirty here. And that's because that's I didn't even know that was I didn't even there was no communication whether Silas was gonna do grubs. I knew that Silas was gonna want to do grubs because of the top side situation. That's just game knowledge, that's just experience, that's just understanding the way the game should be objectively played. That's the most best play, right? So that Trinity had a really good learning journey, right? Learning cycle. He's able to had a he had a made a decision, had a painful experience. He's not having prior for grubs. Why? Let's get into that, and then we can learn, and then we can move on, and we can develop. But if his jungler called that, the chances that he's actually going to complete that learning cycle by himself, he could. His jungler could tell him, and he might have the int- level of introspection to be like, you know what? I should have known that. But I call bullshit. Like mm. that's not gonna, that's just not going to happen. No. You know, it's very, very unlikely. Yeah, very, very unlikely. If someone has an idea for an objective, especially a jungler, they will so, go. So, for so it. my point being is that yes, it, I'm not, I'm not going to sit here and say that it wouldn't be helpful to have someone giving me information. Yes, the I way that I think about is that that's just one positive, and that just does not add yes. really close outweigh all the negatives. That's that, right? exactly. It's one positive. It's like one nitpick. And this is again where people think the Joker is all fairyland. They will look at that point. That's awesome, but that's just like one aspect of one the aspect. Game. Like if you just lose lane, bad reese, all the fundamentals. Like it doesn't matter who you're playing with, who what is your Joker, how good everyone is. You're gonna, you know. You're going to struggle. Yeah, so that is one aspect. Um, but again, it's important to say, again, objectively say that it, w- it would be objectively helpful in that situation. Yeah. And I would make a better law decision in that situation. Long term, it doesn't help my learning though. No. So from top, I think it's very similar. It's a very yep. it's exact it's a solo situation. game. It's I mean, like I it would be helpful for a jungler to give you particular information, whether it be about the enemy jungles, not about them. It could even be they're a second set of eyes and they're able to give them information about what's happening. Oh, their jungler's doing this path. 
Again, the top laner should already be considering what the jungler is doing based on what you're doing with the waves. If you're getting, if your jungler is, on, if you're on red side as a as a top laner and your jungler is pathing top to bot and their jungler is pathing bot to top, that has to be a variable that is considered when it comes to what you're doing with your waves. Or I look at the map quickly in my lull state as a top laner. I see bot lane fully warded. The enemy jungle is not there. I would assume he's probably around top side. Again, right. if you are reliant on communication for that, we need work to do with your gameplay that's because great. that's part of your job in League of Legends. It's part of the game of League. Yes. Being able to utilize Map your is game sense. That's right. Um, okay. What are the other... Are so we've other... established um, mid and top. Okay, so that's, that's, support. that's why yes. Juki is not that helpful because... Um, it's mainly a solo game for most of the game and the early game is pretty big part of League of Legends because of the snowball aspect of the game. Well, that's that, but it's also, again, the, the, um, it's the short term versus long term. That's right. And yeah. that too as well. All right, bot lane, Curtis. Bot lane. So this is where we're maybe going a bit more uncharted territory because mm. we've never played, I mean, you and I have played, I played a lot, a lot of support, support but lot we of haven't support. duo. Never duo. You know? So I guess in theory, um... If you duo and you, then you get to play certain 2v2s and 2v2s oh, uh, matchups are pretty important. Yeah. Setting up, like let's say, for example, the most popular ones like Caitlyn Calm or something like that. Like if you duo queue you, and you're pretty good at that specific, you can roll over a game together. Uh, uh, look, I'm going to say it outright. I just think bot lane duo queue is a different beast. It just, yeah, it's just I think completely it different. I think yes. it's completely different. And I think it's good. I think it genuinely would work. Yeah. And it would be, I think it would be 100 bit more, I, I mean, I think the positives of duo queuing a bot lane would outweigh the negatives, in my opinion. Well, this is interesting, though, because then can't this go down that whole thing of narrative of like, okay, I go into solo mm. and my support suck. Then suddenly their expectations is... And then their relationship with the game ruins again, and then they can only duo. Again, the, it's why I, I firmly believe if you're going to duo queue, you got to fucking go think long term. you got to go like all in. bot duo. You're just a bot duo. Yeah. But then you, you're screwed master plus. Yeah. Right, that's that's one of the other challenges, yeah. right? But but I think, look, that yeah, okay. In terms of, okay, so I want to, let's be very careful here. I think we can all agree. I think you'd be an idiot to think otherwise, <laughs> right? If you're not gonna a duo queue, would be more effective than two solos in bot lane. And we all, we can safely agree on that, right? You get a yep. diamond, two diamond four that are duo together and yep. played a bunch of games together. Yep. And they're, th they're actually really thoughtful about their combination. They're communicating well. They're going to shit on, or they should theoretically shit on two solos. Even if the enemy are probably maybe a little bit better individually, the duo will probably come out. I, I That would be my hope. I'd like to think so. I'd like to think so. <laughs> actually, I want to reframe that. I don't think you'd have to be an idiot, but I think yeah. that would be a, a solid hypothesis. Yeah. yeah. And I'd love to hear from the from the community on this one. I'm sure we have AD carries and supporters who listen to this. I mean, we have we have examples. I mean, again, it depends what guess what rank, right? I mean, we used to get shit on by botland joys all the time back yeah. in the day. Yeah. Well, I mean, like let's say if you were in against like two pro players, part, a big problem with duo queue in Master Tier Plus was it ruined the game. Two player, like if you had like a again Caitlyn Khan or something like a bot, like it's literally like almost impossible to win a game. I have nightmares when when duo queue was enabled against Master Plus where pro players. Yeah. It, was, it was unplayable. Jungle mid, I don't care about yeah, duo. Gives Jungle a top, top mid, nah, that doesn't matter. Nah, but it's nice. just bot. Bot. Yeah. When you had King and Aladoric, whatever, yeah. playing duo queue on bot side or back in the day with like Radier and stuff. I mm. mean, it was just, you couldn't win the game. Mm. I mean, it, that'd be so far ahead. It'd be unbelievable. Too much pressure. Way too much pressure. Remember King Destiny, duo queue back yeah. in the day. Yeah. I mean, it'd be, it was ridiculous. Yeah. Um, okay. So yeah. Okay. That's a hypothesis. We don't know 100%, but I, I'm pretty, I think we're pretty confident that would be the case, right? That would be better in that game. Yeah. But then, then you sort of got to think about it. The way that matchmaking would work then in that situation is that the, it's going to be, you're going to have technically lower rank on the top side, like the MMR will that's be right. balanced. And then you have to like really win bot lane. Yeah, There's more pressure. To People don't understand that about yeah, your IQ at yeah. all. We talk about that. So the matchmaking. So so the, the way matchmaking works is that if you duo queue, your team, so there's either two options or a handful. So the, the, the first one is you're going to have the lower rated members on your team and the enemy can all full solos Sorry, yeah. and you're going to have lower rated members on your team. So that's that's scenario number one. Scenario number two is you first another duo. So that, that kind of balances it out. Scenario number three is you get off roll. So the same rank, but they're off roll. So you get like a mid who's top and then a top who's mid and shit like that. Now... Um, they're the three kind of scenarios, I would say, right? Now, that is puts a lot of pressure on you as a bot lane because if you don't win your lane pretty hard, you're going to, and you don't quote unquote carry, it's 
you're going to lose. It's straight up. It's all on you in a way when you do a cue ball line. You have to perform and you, the pressure is on you. And that's why, like, I mean, you don't see it at the end of the day. You don't go into the ADC or support mains and you see that the only way that like people would just abuse this climb, it actually doesn't work a lot of the time, no. even duo bots. So again, even though you're saying that yeah. there's benefit, I mean, the facts are in anyone that you've sort of see gold, bronze, diamond and stuff like that. Again, unless you're sort of in the pro player bracket, it doesn't actually, it's not that effective. And you know, that's also why, by the way, I feel like I've had a lot of success with secondary bot lane because I feel like if I can minimize bot and I play Ziggs and I minimize bot and like mental booms the game. Yeah, that's right. It actually booms the game yeah, because- you install the game. I, because that is the counter towards your bot in a way. If you can go, if you're, if you're secondary role or you're like offering, you play bot lane, you minimize- and, and you know that means your top side is going to win a lot of the time. That's like a free way to win. It's mm. actually a really free way to win. Mm. Um, so anyway, so you got okay optimizing for the game, but again, the challenges that come along with being a duo bot lane, right? Well, uh, everything that we've explored before, we've seen this in real life. We've literally been in a gaming house. We've seen bot lanes implode for all the multitude of reasons. The the the, the lack of alignment, the way they want to play, the matchups they want to play, the, the lanes they want to play, the way they want to play the lanes. Just mechanical errors mechanical from each errors. of them. Yeah, mechanical errors. We, we went through a whole stint, I'm not going to name names, of a specific iteration of Die Wars when we were back in the day, where um, the support was underperforming. The support was not playing well mechanically. And um, the AD carry was getting really pissed off. And, and, and it got to the point where, you know, the AD carry wasn't trusting his support. And we had to alter the picks that the support was going to pick because the support... Going to just stuff up mechanically. It was going to just stuff up mechanically. Yeah. And so there, there, there was a lot of complexity. Again, it's all good when it's sunshine and rainbows. But what happens when you get that 0-3 block? What happens when shit hits the fan? You guys don't play where you, someone, your duo makes a mistake. There's going to be awkward silence. What, what's going to happen? Are you going to sit on there? It's going to be muted there on Discord. Are you, going to, are you going to talk to them about it? You're not going to talk to them about it. Are they going to go and talk to the other friends that are doing with someone else? There's all this complexity, this human nature shit that you just got to... I mean, we got to accept that it's reality. We can't, we can't just sweep it under the rug. And again, this ties into the whole theme of this episode, which is when we think of Joy Q, we tend to think of it as fairyland, all the positive experience and never the negatives. And I'm guarantee you it. You guys should all think back. All those times where you guys have joyed. Think about those awkward silences in Discord or Skype back in the day or TeamSpeak, whatever the hell you used, where you joy with someone and they've underperformed. Right? Now, look, if you're two very, you know, aligned individuals and you can have that tough conversation with each other and you're very supportive of each other, great. Thumbs up. Is that usually the case? From my experience. From our experience, almost never. never. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so that's an interesting one. I think bot lane is an interesting one. I think it's very different to the other ones. I think it's important to make that distinction. I agree. Um, and, I, and, I, and I like what you said there about the ranked anxiety when there's no joy queue. What happens when you can't joy? What happens when you get mastered to your plus? Yep. Yeah, I generally have... Uh, yeah, I remember having... A, I had an Eve player that like mm. always joy... Like literally only always joy. He'll rotate between people. And he would i mean he barely even played because he had to wait for his drawers all the time right, right? that's one of the other challenges <laughs> right yeah that was literally literally just duo, right? playing, so yeah. it was just the biggest struggle and we he couldn't he couldn't play the game solo anymore so basically he's ruined his whole league experience he can't play the game mm. solo mm. which i think is just such a shame that is such a shame i, I just don't think you can go down the duo it's just not practical it's from not a practical. time standpoint what was that person quits or like <laughs> you know what i mean it's just not yeah what if they don't want to play what if they're going to holiday <laughs> yeah or they sw yeah go get it's like what, you know what i mean it's just that's just so it's, it's such weird. a shame that's not how leagues are meant to be you know um Okay, one of the, the big challenges, actually, I want to go back to now, holistic challenges of Joy Q. And this is something that I definitely have felt back in the day when I did do a bit of Joy, is feeling like I'm, I'm like I'm like getting mind controlled by my Joy, just subconsciously by being in a Joy. Curtis, you know what people will say? I say the danger is I don't get affected by a Joy. People bullshit. That is the biggest cope. Yeah. I've Hopium. ever heard. Hopium. It's not reality. You will subconsciously get influenced by a duo no matter what. Even if they don't even say anything, just the fact that their presence is in the game, you're going to start, you're going to do little things differently. You're going to do things differently. And that's the number one problem. And and, and it feels terrible because, you know, you make a decision that you fundamentally don't believe in. It doesn't work, but you don't have that learning because you didn't commit to your call. You didn't commit to your decision. And that's, again, the way I view duo, the, the, the number one, I'm going to just say it outright. The number one problem with duo is this. Right, this is across all roles, all ranks, this is it. Is that you're not you're interfering with the learning cycle. It's that simple. 
someone else is having a hype, making or influencing your hypothesis. It's not your hypothesis. Therefore, when the result happens, the learning, you can't own the learning. You cannot own the learning because it's not truly your learning. It's like a skin in the game or mm. a cat res- like your responsibility. It's like, well, this is not my play. So I'm just going to follow. Or you it. know, subconsciously that you've been influenced by that person. So, you know, it's not you've really got an easy cop out as well. Yeah. Easy excuse. Yeah. Very easy. That's excuse. a subconscious the, thing. The, that sure. is the beauty of solo queue. It, 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 it forces you to take max. It, it's the only way maximum responsibility. There is no one else, but you, you are the only soul factor and contributing factor. It, joy queue adds so much complexity. Doesn't it? So much complexity to your journey because now it's just not you. It's someone, a whole nother person there is interfering with your learning journey. It's not just you. And that is the beauty of solo queue. It's you in the shit, in the mud, having to crawl your way out of it and figure out a way and develop a toolkit to do so. And it's convenient. Ticks all the boxes. That's another thing as well that I think, uh, uh, you know, people have the mindset of I go in duo queue i increase my chances because i don't have three you know bots on my mm. team i think that's another reason why people duo queue is that they don't want to be accountable for the game that's a that is another reason why people would duo. it's a it's a it's a, yeah it's an ego it's a protection defense mechanism in a way 100 percent. and if you fail it's like you know it's not only you you fail with someone else you've got someone else to share that burden with in a way you know, you know, this is an interesting experiment here. I want, I want, I want to do a thought. Uh, what do they call it? Like a, a thought experiment. A thought experiment. Thought experiment. Yep. Imagine for a second that league there was no solo. It was only duo. Now that doesn't even make doesn't sense make logistically, but let's yeah. just say hypothetically, yeah. you could only queue up as a party, or let's say twos or threes. That makes it. That, that makes sense, right? Yep. And such that. You know, we, we played the game for the past 14 years with only duos and trios. And then one day, magically, a new rank system came out where it was only solo. What do you think would happen? I think that the junglers would be the worst players. <laughs> <laughs> they would be, uh, they would be the worst players and that would be destroyed. <laughs> Right? That's why okay. I know what will happen for a fact. Yeah, like a, a gold jungler in the team play would be bronze. Yeah, that would be sh- that'd be shocking. That would be shocking. Okay, what else? What else do you think would happen? What else would happen? Try to visualize that. Do you think you would be excited? Do you think that you would be excited, or, or do you think no one would play it? I think everyone would be excited because they're all losing their minds playing with each other and not get any anywhere. I think everyone would think, holy shit. This might be, again, my, my, me going through this whole process. Holy shit. Finally a chance to prove who's really the best. Yeah, there you go. Yes. That's it. That's simple. It's yeah. like, oh my God, I've been having to deal with Jim Bob and bloody, yeah. you know, um, whatever his name in, in Duo Q and they're so annoying. To, okay, let's see who's really good. We're on an even playing field now. I want to see where I'm at. I want to see where I'm at. I want to see where everyone's at. I think that's what everyone would be begging for. Mm -hmm. Let's just do the opposite. You know what I mean? Like you just think of it like that. Yeah. I guess it's really simple. Really simple. Yeah. You don't know. And this is what I've realized with Lee. And we've seen this time and time again with Lee. You don't know what we take. We just take Lee for granted. We fucking do. We, we, we bitch and moan. People bitch and moan about, you know, how shit Lee can be about balance or trolls and MMR and rank and, Oh my god, emeralds are possible to get through, right? <laughs> and the the reality is that league is so, we've we've got it good here. We've got a great balanced yeah. game. You can play basically any champ in the game to a very high level. Roles are relatively balanced. You can climb with every role. Yep. Every type of champion. Yep. It's fucking ridiculous. It's you have crazy. solo queue. It's crazy. A fucking awesome rank system. Yeah. We've got it pretty damn good. Yeah. You know when you really think of it, you know. I I th- I know. Like, well aware shit, of that, Curtis. Man. I've come from many other competitive games, and just, I just I want to I like putting that. I out think there we always need to put that out there. It's important. It's important. It's, it's a message of the BBC. Honestly. <laughs> it is. Like God, man. Like, come on. Let's have some fun playing League. Let's of have it's some a great fun. game. Okay, so we've covered a lot here. 
Okay, so Curtis, what are we now, moving on to? I want to talk about playing with people, Juku, when you're new to the game. Mm. See, this is where I think that there is massive value. Like, I'm talking about leveling up to 30, just playing with friends. Mm. That's how a lot of us got into the okay. game, right? Playing with friends, teaching them. You know, it's like, oh, this is what this champ does. And like having that... Because we talk, you know, we don't want to be that serious like at, at the, the beginning. beginning you yeah, know, you sure. know how we say, just play every champ. Don't too much about process. That's what we talk about. So like one to 30 and even maybe a bit beyond that, um, normal games experience. But when it's like, okay, I'm, I'm, I want to see where I'm at playing you know your first games in iron bronze then that shouldn't be in a duo yeah, experience at all i think it's a really good point yeah i like that i mean i think it's really handy imagine having someone st- you know showing you the road quickly telling you this is what this champ does this is you know i think that would speed up your learning mm. journey significantly i like it i think it makes sense so that's me. where i think it is very you think but again but that's not really joy q that's, that's, more... that's just like normal this games is, yeah just playing with people up, right yeah. Yeah, it's partying up. But it's still worth to mention, right? Because it's yeah. like, you know, people be like, you guys are just, you know, do you only solo? But, but even- the way I thought you were talking about it is like when you first play ranked, like Iron, if you, imagine if you, your first ranked games with Duo Oh yeah, that's completely. It's game over. Yeah, it's absolutely game over. <laughs> it's absolutely game over. That's but, like the worst thing you could possibly do, I think. One of the worst things. Yeah, because I guess it's the blind lead and the blind, right? Especially, let's say there's two... Like, I was just trying to think. I guess there's, there's just no winning scenario. If there's two mm. iron players or bronze, mm. it's the blind lead and the blind, and mm. you're just completely ruining each other's experience oh. of the game. And if you're getting, uh, you know, playing with a person that's a bit higher ranked, playing thing, then you're just purely just getting... Dis- you're not having any learning. You know, you're getting elo boosted or getting like... boosted, yeah. You know, you're, you're, you're going to be just sort of where you actually are on the rank ladder. And if you're, let's say, you're drawing your gold friend. Yep. That will completely, yeah. As you said, it's game over. At game that over. Point. <laughs> game absolutely game there's over. There's a lot. There's a let's just say there's a deep hole we'd we'll have to dig ourselves out of. Very, very much so. I think it's so funny, Curtis, that you like you try to go. It's like Nathan. I'll be like the four yeah, year. Yeah, it's hard. Skirt, it's Curtis, hard. I'm dragged. It's really overwhelming when you get into it. Because Curtis, the, the, the honest truth is that we've had seen so many of our students, people in our program, mm-hmm. so many people right into this show where duo Q is detrimental. I don't think we have seen yet no. yet a positive duo Q and experience. If, if, you, if you've had a positive duo Q experience, let us know. Let us know. They, I'm sure they exist. Yeah, I'm sure they exist. We just have they seen they would yet. exist in isolation in certain time. Again, if we think about over mm. the long run, they, I would say we wouldn't ever see that. Right. You know, like people say, I might say, like, oh, a duo would like my, you know, my my friend in like platinum. Like we like learned a lot about something like that. You know, mm. but it's like. You know, you're not going to maintain that. It's just not going to work in the long run. Mm. It's going to hurt you more. Yeah, than but maybe that's what Juicy is. Maybe, maybe, maybe the the best way to do Juicy is you do it in a stint. You do it in a way to learn some specific element of the game or something. Or I, I don't know. I don't know. Let me know. I would. Yeah, know. that's what that's what I'm. Hoping. I'm, I want to say stay as <laughs> open minded as possible here. If there is someone listening who has had a positive Juicy experience, let us know. Let us know the de- get specific. Yeah, you would. I want to see. O- get specific. I would need to see OPG. You need to tell me which times you think because yep. how pe- long did it go? People for? would have interesting recollections of their Juicy experience as well. Like honestly, like as bad as this is sound, sound, I don't feel like I would trust people writing in right. unless I saw. Like even like games where they duoed with each other yeah, and stuff, because right. I could just start dissecting so the, things. Because you're getting an email saying, "Oh yeah, five years ago, me and my mate had a few beers and played duo." It's like it was well, five so years fun. ago, the game was different, <laughs> and like you know what I mean. Like so, it, it's I would take that with a grain of salt, even if someone was to write that in. Yeah, you right. know. Okay. Hey, right, what else? So, what else did you want to cover here with this, in reference to duo here? Um. I want to touch on just communication a little bit more, just writing out our thoughts there. Okay. People have a very... When people think about communication in League of Legends, they think about macro calls, mm. right? Like, that's what they think, right? Yeah, right, interesting. Like, it's like macro call. Like, they hear like things like, oh, let's go. We're going to fight this drug. We're going to call front to back in these fights and stuff like that. Communication in a solo queue, a ranked perspective, because it's like really... With duo queue, like, emphasizes the communication aspect. You're basically completely throwing out champ mastery the way that i think about it like the moment you're in that mindset of communication champ mastery is gone let's i want to i want to frame it a different way i'll be honest i i, does, I don't resonate with that okay. I, frame it a, I need to think high level first and get into the detail right. right so the way my brain works with this is that there are different types of communication but in order to even like why communicate let's what's the problem why is why is league hard okay why is league hard I want to break it down to the three, the, 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 I call it, I don't have a name. I need to give it a name, but the three categories of problems. 
Gathering information is challenge number one. Processing information is challenge number two. And execution is challenge number three. I would say this is the three main reasons or every mistake in league can basically be boiled Sometime. down yeah. to these three categories, okay? okay. Now, either one of them or m many of them, okay? Gathering of information is difficult in league because there is just so much, so many pieces of information to look at and let, let alone what, what information to look for. Right, so it's like you're in a, you're in a, you press tab. It's like, well, what the fuck do I look at? What's important? What's not important? And actually, the raw, the raw process of literally using a lull state to gather information, especially for a laner, it's probably easy for a jungler to get more downtime. But as a laner, it's hard. Gathering information is hard, especially when the game's moving quick, things are changing. It's hard. So that's one challenge. Now, communication can can actually help with that, right? Because you got someone can give you information. Hey, uh, jungler's on bot side. Dragons come up in 30 seconds. Um, support's missing. This is this is not process. This is pure gathering of information. Okay? That's, that's, that's number one. Number two is processing of information, which is, that's where macro comes to play. This is actual decision making. An example of, in communication of this category would be, um, let's, we should start Baron on spawn. You should hover me topside. Um, I need you to help me get out this wave. Hmm. Right, so the communication in relation to some sort of macro onto decision. Now, processing information is a challenge in league because, again, it's not overly obvious what we need to do in a particular moment, right? So I guess one of the positives of communication is that, again, you could you could get someone aligned with what you want to do or tell someone what to do. Maybe you have a very clear idea about how to win the game and you can really communicate that effectively, really simply, without having to fuck around with pings and, and typing, right? Right. And the third one is execution. I think that's just not really applicable here. Yeah. I think where you're struggling to get my point about the communication there is that, yes, people think about communication in terms of macro, which is helpful. Yes. Yes. That's where, communication, that's where communication actually is most effective in league, in the mid game and stuff like that. Mm. But that's not what most of the game is, mm. is what I'm saying. Interesting. I was actually going to say the other way around. I don't think that is helpful. What's not helpful? Because I was actually going to say that that macro stuff's not helpful. I think uh, what is helpful is the gathering of information. Oh, gathering information. Because when I think of optimal communication to duo, let's say if I had to duo, oh yeah, you, the gathering information. Yes, that like is the flash most important. Timers and that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah like yeah. like if we were to duo, right, and we yeah. had to make it work. Yeah. The way we would make it work. Here's the information. You make the decision. Exactly. <laughs> I don't. I don't want to hear what you want me to do. I don't even want to know what you're going to do. You just tell me information that you think is relevant. So it's like we're fighting dragon, and you say Jin has no flash. Like that, that's fucking, that's good information. Like, yep. like that would, that, that's helpful. That's very, very right. helpful. Yeah. We say, um, uh, uh, Nico has no R. Things like that. Like things that are very, like very key pivotal pieces of, of distilled, specific, relevant information. Right? Yeah. That's more, that, that is, in my opinion, the, if, 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 if we all had to communicate with Joku, that would be, the way that's the most effective thing yeah but then opinion. then again you would argue again it's like you know a, a challenge player they they should you know where everyone gets to from a solo perspective it's much more efficient if they know that information that doesn't need to be said and they should be able to know that like a nico alt that could be quite obvious when that's happening mm. a flash like a jungler you know using f keys and stuff like that like that is the skill of the game is in is a massive part of the skills information collection for yourself sure and you have to build that skill. There's no way around that. Yeah, you can get patched up a little bit, but again, the patching up, that's more competitive, you know, in a yeah, way. Yeah, so I, I see what you mean. You're, you're viewing communication in this sense as a band-aid solution. Yeah, it's a band-aid solution. It's a band-aid solution. You should be able to, pro you should be gathering this information yourself. Yes. And, and it's way more efficient when you do that yourself because then you don't, you know, get you're not so, and leak so fast paced. It's like, you're going to instantly, you're going to be approaching that fight already knowing that this person has, you know, maybe they're, you know, let's say in a fight, let's, ults and flashes are a bit more big, but let's say, uh, Zeri just used her E or whatever. You know what I mean? Like that, that sh you should, you just too slow by the time that's been communicated. Right. You're already not ready to capitalize on that. Right. So I, I totally agree with you. Again, this is thinking more long-term, right? Long-term for the learning. But, but I will say, again, if we're optimizing for the short term, what would give us the most success in the short term, you giving key pieces <clears throat> of information yeah. would help. Yeah, so I guess this whole conversation's been about yeah, short term, long term, communication exactly. duo. Yeah. So communication again. That's why I think communication is distilled into really two things. You're either giving 
information, right? Key piece of information, or you're giving directives, which is relating to macro, and this is relating to to processing information, right? I I think that pro, like the stuff about directives and macro is probably the worst form of communication, because that means that if you're having to tell someone what the best thing to do in terms of the game, what the best macro decision is, you're you're not aligned at all. No. Like it, it like if we're at joy queuing and then you're having to say, Curtis, why are you why are you going bot barons up? Or like we should be playing for Baron. No shit. Yeah, it's like, too uh, light against. That means we're light. not on the same level. That mm. means we shouldn't even be doing it in the first place. That mm. means that we're just not even on the same level. Mm. Like again, that that you're that, at that point you're one hundred percent like compensating for them, and you're one hundred percent sabotaging their learning journey. I need to fail in that situation. If I'm if I'm making a play bot when Baron's up, I need to have that painful experience. I need to then lose Baron. <laughs> you know, I don't want I don't want you to tell me to not go for that play. You know, you know what I mean. And that's where it goes into long term, short term, and that's really, really, I think it is it's that simple. Now you've got a point. You want to move on? Yep. You want to? Move, you've got a point here that says. I mean, we covered a lot about the communication there with in that other segment, talking about the jungle and how that affects and stuff. So I think that I just wanted to just wrap it up a yep. little bit there, just to touch yep. on a little bit more. Um, should Riot remove Jiroku altogether from ranked? From ranked competitive for a competitive, so there's there's one competitive integrity, right? The ranked ladder would be more polished of exactly where everyone should be. Mm-hmm. Um, now this is the interesting thing, you know, talking about, you know, we've talked a lot about right as sort of mixed messaging about what ranked is, and they're mm-hmm. pretty bad about that. It's like the fun, you know, is is it more fun to play with your friends? It's like, well, should that be a different? client or different you know you're going like okay i'm having fun with friends versus i'm here to go into the dojo blood sweat and mm. tears right it muddies the waters a bit like the because f- people would think about juro queue as like a it's a, you know a social thing right so the other day a lot of people play games with the social aspect right so it's like a more of a fun thing right so just removing that you know hurt the player base but in the long run maybe make me maybe make the game more serious like everyone knows it's hardcore so they're sort of the challenges i guess yeah, look, I, I don't think Duo at the moment is actually a problem because I think Riot have actually figured out a really, really effective ways to to balance Duo. Yeah, with the I think so as well. And yeah. Like, I think they've they've managed it for now. Look, I, I, I don't... Yeah, I wouldn't say it's a big... It's, it's a not really a big problem. All, no. It's not really a big problem. No. I, I do think it's a problem Master Plus. Yeah. I'm glad they did they they made that adjustment that. and they yep. did that. But I, but I think that... Um, to have it for the general community, look, I agree with you. I think it would be way neater and tidier and just make more sense if you just had solo queue and then flex queue. Like that would be so much simpler. Like let's just like cut the crap. You have solo. It's a very hyper competitive environment. We know what it's about, you know. Um, and then you have flex queue, which is a little bit more casual, still maybe a bit competitive, but you know it's a different ball game. It's a different. It's a different thing. I think that would make more sense. That's just my two cents. But I can understand why Riot would probably want to keep it in. Um, it's and a I, bit more of a player look, base going on. Yeah, and I, and I really think what what the way... I'm, I'm Again, I'm going to try and read the mind of Riot. I think what they're probably thinking is that it's a great way to ease people into ranked. Maybe there's a lot of people that are scared of playing ranked and it's like, okay, maybe their friend can play a game with them or two and then ease them into it, then they're okay. But even though we know that's bullshit and that's not the way it works, that person who's scared of ranked and gets joy is they're not going to play ranked long-term anyway, in my opinion. Um, but I can see why the right executive team <laughs> would, would want that to be a thing, right? I'm just visualizing the boardroom and everyone's sitting around and there's like a, it's like I mean, they've probably had this conversation so many times. It's on the right? agenda. It's like, yeah. okay, we're going to be talking about Joy we? And, and it always comes up as, ah, oh, it's good to have too scary and annoy too many people to remove it. It's kind of like one of those legacy things that it's been around in the game mm. for so long. Like it's like oh we we can manage it for now. It's probably we're gonna piss more people off by getting rid of it, getting rid of it, than pleasing people if we, you know what I mean? If we get rid of it, it's just one of those things. So I think because and if Jiroku never existed in the first place, no one would even be complaining about it. It's just because we've had it. When you take something away from people, it pisses people off. Yeah. So I think it's just one. It's of probably those not deals. worth asking. I agree. Exactly. But yeah, yeah, and no, I don't think it's that big of a problem. Um, the only problem I did see was Master Plus. So why was why was it a problem for you, Master Plus, Nathan? What we talked about before about the, um, yeah, the duo Q aspect, the, um, there was like that whole situation of like MMR, like you could be like a master player playing with someone like D and then like you're boosting the MMR, they keep losing their D1 programs and stuff like that. There's lots of weird things. It's just, again, and the competitive integrity as well. It's like, 
I mean, maybe maybe Master is maybe too lot. Maybe they should do it for only Grandmaster Plus. Maybe since there's a lot more Master players nowadays. Maybe you know, I want to. Or... I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna say something here controversial mm. about this. When this initially happened, I thought this was an amazing thing, and and look, I do think it has a lot of benefits. But I'll say this: Q Master Plus wouldn't be a problem, okay, if it was only bot lane duos. Like, 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 for example, you know oh, what I mean? Okay. So let's say like a bot lane duo had to pop into a bot lane duo. Maybe that wouldn't be too bad. But again, the challenges you face then is that Master Plus is just not many players. So the matchmaking could that get be messed so up. Hard, yeah. It'd be so hard. Yeah, it would ruin, it would ruin queue times. Or one of the other things as well is what, what I hated was this, this is what we saw all the time. You would get a team on the enemy team that had duo. And to offset that, the other team would be off roll, but then they would say the swap, swap, yeah. And the champs like that. That is what fundamentally. If there was no chatting, no swapping, and everyone had to play the role that they played, then it would be fine. But that's not what happens in reality. You get, you know, you get you, what we had is like two, you know, seven hundred LP players duo queuing together, and they say, okay, we're gonna give the the enemy team the same like seven hundred LP players, but then the mid lane is playing support and the top's playing jungle, right? But then they all say, oh, I don't play jungle, I don't play top. You'll swap around, you'll get your main roles. And it's like, well, what the fuck? This is this doesn't make sense whatsoever. And it's not balanced at all. And because swapping is a thing, and people actually really try to get their role, it breaks the system. Swapping and 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 the whole changing role shit breaks the system. So that's why Joy Q, yeah, I guess can't work. As long as that function is in play, it can't work. Yeah, it can't work because yeah, this it's just the it just explodes. It the explodes matchmaking. the matchmaking, and then again, again, the the issue you face is that a, a, a top a mid jungle duo is nowhere near as effective as a bot lane duo. So unless you can somehow guarantee that it's a bot lane duo versus a bot lane duo, it's just never fair. Hmm. Um, and so yeah. There's just not enough play base to... to so um, that's where you would be fine with it. If the player base Master Plus was so large that you could guarantee two bot lane joys against mm. each other, then that would be fine. Mm. But we don't live in a world in which that's the case. No. So it's that simple. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> the last sort of topic here is, yeah. So there, there has been a lot of... Um, a lot of conversation around duo queue and master tier plus because like good look at the good old days where like you know the streamers and stuff could duo with each other mm. and really help the the general interest of the game you know people like oh look at how fun you know that is you know it's like you know two friends you know get into the high ranks together and you know they're taken against other pro players or something like that um and that's why people have the argument to bring sort of duo back around that just for just general interest in the, the streaming culture and stuff but again i think in the long run I think it just has more negatives and positives. What do you think? I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, look, I, I think we can all agree that if you had Jor and, and Master Boss, it would be better for the streaming community. I mean, there's no doubt about that. Um, but again, at what cost? It's at what cost? M you know, ranked integrity, matchmaking integrity for the people that are genuinely trying to climb Master Plus who don't have a Joy partner or mm. not, who don't, get, don't give a shit about streamers. Then, yeah, it's good for everyone else. But at the expense of a lot of people, so in my opinion, in my opinion, it just doesn't really make sense for competitive integrity. You need to have a place. I mean, the 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 most important thing, right? The the way Riot die, the way League dies, is that they fuck with the ranked integrity. That's right. Competitive integrity. It's probably simple. That is the most. That is the the, the cornerstone of League success. A very solid rank system that's, that's extremely fair, challenging robust yeah it works as long as that exists league will be in a good position as soon as they mess with that formula that is when shit goes goes crazy 100 percent agree um so yeah look we've tried to cover a lot of stuff here hopefully that you know this episode is you know can live live here on the BBC and we can refer this to people who ask about duo Q. Yep, just point them here. <laughs> I would love, I'm very fascinated. Yeah. I want to be open-minded. If we get some very high quality comments on this one about duo Q, who change, how, who it gives us a different perspective, we will touch on it on the next episode. I think it's important to hear from the community. Yeah. I genuinely want to see what people have to say about this because there are people out there we've seen that are very passionate about duo Q. I want to hear why. What did we miss? If we missed anything, let us know. I'll, what do you reckon? I'd love to do like a case study. Like if someone comes to us saying Joku is mm. awesome, this is how we learn. And they gave a really thorough response. Thorough response. Mean. But they actually sent us like 
10 games. Right, interesting. Like 10 back-to-back games, not nitpicks games, mm. of them Joku and their comms and we'll break that down. Mm. That might be interesting. That'd be an interesting case study. Yeah. The, the Joku case study. Mm. Something to think about. You want to move on to mailbag or? Yep. So we'll skip their clip today and summoner school. Yep. We'll go straight into Nathan's mailbag. Away we go. All righty then. Our first question here comes from Alexander. The title of this email is Getting Better at F Keys and Map Awareness. Hi, Nathan and Curtis. I'm a big fan of the podcast. My name's Alex, and I've been a EU master tier Ari Pantheon mid main. By reviewing my games, I have noticed that I tend to overlook roam angles, which is especially bad considering the champions that I play. Watching Nemesis, I've noticed that he uses F keys all the time to check on his side lanes. And I was amazed how effortlessly he does it. Since then, I've tried to incorporate F keys to get a better understanding of what's going on outside of mid lane. But no matter what I do, I just can't get the hang of it. In lol lol states, it's all right. But other than that, it often results in me mispositioning or dropping CS. Would you have any tips on how to improve this? Maybe some special key bindings or something, or do I have to just brute force into it into my muscle memory? Thanks in advance. So what binds do you use, Curtis, for your The FDs? mouse button and T. One mouse button. Two. I've got two on the side of my mouse okay. and then T. Oh, T. So I don't do all the roles. So I do bot, top, and jungle. So ADC. I don't do support. You don't need to support because they're not the one that interacting with the wave. I don't know. I just I just don't have any more. <laughs> oh, is that right? <laughs> if I had three, I, I actually have a thought it. process. I don't have to do support because they're not interacting with the wave. Yeah, well, I had three buttons, and that's like I realized that's, that's all I'm capable of doing. Yeah. Like let's like like I was honest with myself. Okay, yep. T I can do. Yep. And these two mouse buttons, I don't feel like there's a lot of effort for me to use a fourth. So I'm like, all right, I'm just gonna pick these roles. So yeah, I use the two mouse buttons for top and uh, bot and jungle is T. No, sorry, the other way around. So jungle top is my mouse buttons and T is my AD carry. I see. So yeah, I'm the similar, but I mean, I'm the jungler, right? So I have, I just use the two mouse buttons though. Oh, right. So I do shift one mouse button, the side, because mm. I only have two mouse buttons, top, uh, then just the normal one mm. mid and then the bot, the, the, okay. the other one, uh, AD carry. Oh, so you don't do support either? No. Oh. Because it's just, yeah, I don't need to. Yeah. Because okay. bot will get me to the bot lane. Again, yep. the way I think about it is that support, yeah, I can like, look at the minimap, exactly. they're roaming and stuff. Like, I know that. It's more about the AD carry. The AD carry is the one actually hitting last hit in. the F keys themselves are terrible. It's just a yeah, terrible yeah, location. Unplayable. You see a lot of people use uh, ZXCV. That's what a lot of pro players, that's oh, very really? common. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's, I think that's the most common one. Okay. Or people will use like A, you know, S mm. and all that sort of stuff. Because obviously Q, W, E, R. Mm. But yeah, play around with it. What don't you feel use comfortable. F keys. Yeah, but no, F keys are not I, realistic. I don't know anyone who uses F keys. No. But they just got F keys, that's the default. That's right. So yeah, you got to find what works for you. But I do think it's useful, I, I, especially as a Master Plus player. I think that's the small details that now are, are Very relevant important. to you in your yeah. journey, especially when you're an Ari Pantheon player. So my advice though for actually learning that skill is go hard on it in the lol states. Every lol state, spam them. Like build that muscle memory. And if you do that again and again and again and again with reasonable keybinds, it will stick. It will just take time. Yep. Getting more specific around uh, information collection and F keys. So as you sort of see things happening, you'll start prioritizing. Like like you, when people think about F keys, they think of like fake, like doing all three yeah. lanes. It's not actually practical at all, even the top players. So what it would be, it's like a, a sequence might be, okay, um, lol state, I check top, check bot. Uh, you know, go for some things like, you know, push a wave, check top, check bot. Oh, in something interesting happening, bot. Uh, next lol state, then it won't be top anymore, be bot mm. again, bot again, bot again. And then it's like, okay, that situation's gone. You know what I mean? Like, you that's the way it will sense. work. Yeah, it's sort of like, you know, be sort of, because F keys, there's, I sort of view them as two different ways. It's like the, the it, you can spam them, you get very little bits of information, not the complete picture. So sometimes I'll sit on my F key a little bit more. It's like, okay, I'm, I want to look a bit more about what's going there. And then it'll start prioritizing based on win conditions, heavy trading, all, you know, alts, all that sort of stuff. So, you know, don't think about it too like, you know, just I just got to spam my F key. It's no. like, you got to be intentional still with your F key usage. So the spamming is great for just quickly getting like HP, um, mana, you know, like quick wave state, like really quick. And then if you need to understand a bit more, it's like, oh, I don't know if that's pushing. I don't know if that's slow pushing. Like, and then you need to like sit on it a little bit more and then maybe do it multiple times during your lull states or whatever. Yep, totally. Exactly right. And, and 
I don't know about you, but I, I look at the minimap first a lot of the time. Yeah, minimap is where most of the most beginning, of the information, the beginning, it's like the FKs, first step. Yeah. It's like, oh, okay, my tops and base. I'm not going to pan my camera to my top laner. I look at the minimap, say, okay, my jungles. I'm not going to, I'm not going to look at my jungle doing krugs. You know, I don't give a shit. It's like I look at the minimap first. I look at the situation. I'm like, okay, my jungles on krugs and my tops and base. All right, I'm going to probably can pan my camera bot. I'm not going to look at top or jungle. So it's like. Again, common sense, but just look. I usually look at the minimap first. Though. Yeah, but it's a combination of both, right? Combination yeah. of both. Like, it's like in the early game, I just spam F keys everywhere because I just need to know what's going on with every right. wave all the time, and then I'll start to prioritize based on what I right. see. Right, and waves. I think there's role differences as yeah. well. Yeah, and then in the mid game, which for jungle would be more minimap first, then F key second. Right. So it actually evolve throughout the game. Yep. But yeah, practice makes perfect, yeah? Focus on it. Look at yep, your reviews. Time. Look at every single time you, you have a lull state and you're not getting information. Why, you know? Is it intensity issue? It could be as well, you know? You're just like... Yeah, and you will probably have to purposely overwhelm your mental stack to get it done. Yeah, and you will sacrifice CS or, you know, yep. trade. No, and, uh, actually, no. Uh, yeah, sorry. I will say one more thing about that. You know, about minimap awareness as well. You'll see me sometimes even to this day... If I know that it's a very volatile situation, I really, really need to spend mental cycle on the minimap or I need to look somewhere, I'll literally step back in lane. I'll forego a trade. Oh, I'll, yeah. I'll literally... Because you need to know what's I going on. I need to know what's going on. I can't just stand there and run into the email. I literally step back, process information, then come back. Now, obviously, you know, that's maybe not the most optimal, but sometimes you got to do what you got to do. I'm not a robot. I don't have the ability to like go in between and, you know, you can get to a very, very, very high level that way, you know? So there's that as well. Yeah. Love it. All right, moving on here. Uh, Jesse, the title of this email is Level Zero. Hello, Curtis and Nathan. I'm brand new to League of Legends and competitive PC PvP gaming for that matter. After taking in many BBC podcasts and signing the Solid Q contract, I've gathered enough tools for my toolkit to overcome the anticipatory anxiety I developed around playing with and against other people in normal games. I'm taking your advice of beginning with champ mastery. My question is, after I've picked a champion and role, what is the next step? All of my fundamental CS in trading, basic micro, and many more I'm not even aware of yet are at the, a very beginner level. Do I need to focus on any one of these in practice tool before jumping into normals, or do I just embrace the suck and play lots of games, worry about these details later? I wouldn't even think about fundamentals at all. Yeah, I mean, he says, uh, my question is, after I've picked a champ and role, what's the next step? champ <laughs> you know what i mean like keep going down that champ roll play play a lot of champs so just play one champion play many many champions yes. like play you might play 20 games one champ then move on again and go 30 games of another champ just move on cycle through like you once you and then if you do that along you will play multiple roles as well but let's say you find a role play all different mid champions so you like play mid for you like mid play all different mid champions play a bunch of them 20 games of each just go through go through go through and also, um, don't worry about fundamentals and any, anything like that. Just literally play... Because your goal at the very beginning, right? You might ask why. The goal at the very beginning is actually not to learn fundamentals. The goal at the beginning is to learn what everything does. That's it. You have to learn what every item does in every champion. That's mission number one. Yep. And feel it all out. Because you could be looking at the fundamentals and like, you know, all this and like wave, you know, if you learn all that stuff... But you don't know about a Cho'Gath queue. Yep. It's like, well, it's just no it's pointless, you know? Like, this is literally step pointless. number one. So, yeah, learn all the champs in the game. Make sure that... He says that, but he says that he says he's picked a champion. So, maybe he's done that. Maybe, maybe not. You see people that take it too literally. <laughs> yeah. Champ mastery. No, you got to play a lot of champions. Yeah. I get people in my program, in my MLS program, who who skipped that step. They haven't played a bunch of champions. And I say, dude, you just got to play a bunch of champions. You're not ready to main a champ yet. That's, that's a very important step. You need to view the game through differing lenses. Very important. Um, and that's what you'll be for true beginners, though, more advice, that's right? Correct. Yeah, for true beginners. Yep. like Pre-level 30, yep. level 30, even low iron. Um, so let's say, again, he's done that and he's picked the champion. What's okay. next? Again, my, my, my thought process is you gotta well, you got to play ranked with that champion and just get, you know, your first 45 games with that champion and just, just assess. Play a lot of normal games first. Once you feel like you're pretty reasonable, you're feeling a bit confident in your in your normal games, then send it into ranked. Yes. And then that's where we got to get into some, maybe some yeah. like, trading patterns and fundamentals a little bit. So it goes, play a bunch of different champs, normal games, yep. pick, pick, a, one pick one in normal games, get comfortable, then ranked. Yes, that's correct. And then once you're getting into ranked, then we can 
start to maybe look at fundamentals a little bit. And, but even then, like Miles at the start, it's more so just champ mastery stuff, like how to use your Q, W, E, R well. Trading patterns. Identity, champ identity, champ key identity. spikes, key, you know, all that stuff. I wouldn't even, you remember champ mastery related stuff always comes before fundamentals. Even though that sounds weird, it is what it is. Yeah. Actually, you know, I've really thought about this a lot, Nathan. I don't even know if I like the term fundamentals. I feel like fundamentals, it's just, it's weird. I, I feel like the fundamentals of the game are actually understanding what all the champs are. In a weird, because think about it. What what the term fundamentals means is that it's it's literally like that's like the first thing you learn, you know. But in league, that's not the case. No, right. It's kind of like the, the fundamentals of the game actually should be underlying game concepts. That that's like the first. That's like literally the first thing you need to learn, which is understanding XP and gold. Understanding like you know what neutral objectives do and how jungle camps work yeah. and understand all the champions. You know yeah. what I mean? You don't really call that, you don't think they call it fundamentals. That's just like learning league, then champion, then the actual fundamentals. Where do you like, want to I don't put know. I just feel like, I just feel really unprofessional. Not unprofessional. Like, okay. When you, when, when I hear. It's like how, learn how to MOBA works. Yeah. But I don't know because like, I feel like when I hear the term fundamentals, the first thing, like if I would say I'm new to a new, in a new sport, for example, I'm saying ba playing basketball. You're going to get into like, you're going to get a coach and okay, okay, we're, today we're talking about the fundamentals of basketball. Yeah. Like you would start with like the fundamentals of basketball, the fundamentals of drill or something. Like when I think of fundamentals, I think that's the beginning. Maybe, maybe that is, maybe I'm overcomplicating it, but like fundamentals, it's, it's weird that we say, oh, fundamentals come later. It just, it just doesn't. No. Like what the fuck no, is that? I, the way that I, <laughs> I, I think I still, I like the word fundamentals. Right. For like it's confusing though, kind how of. waves the fundamentals of wave the fundamentals of what makes a good and a bad gank. Like I think that has to be there, but it's like let's learn how basketball works first. Right. It's just not using that word fundamentals. That's what I'm saying. And then it's champ mastery, and then it's fundamentals. <laughs> so like learn so it's a fundamentals, then gems, and fundamentals. Yeah, so, technically, so it's fundamentals of. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I just feel like we're using a term too liberally. I feel like we need to be more like. Yeah, maybe the English. There needs to be another word. Maybe the English language is too limited, get us. No, or we're just, just not. Yeah, we're we're just, just, we're just, I, I feel like we're just going, you know what's, again, I, okay, I don't want to harp on on this, but one last thing. I feel like we've seen, we've when we entered the coaching industry, we've heard the term fundamental. It actually doesn't really mean much. It do, me. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's just been yeah. like, we've just like yeah. adopted this yeah. bullshit term. It, Some yeah. like Joe Blow, when I knew nothing about teaching league, <laughs> made up this term, said this term and said, this is the yeah. fundamentals. And now we've just, you know, continued the, you know, this, gone down this line of idiocy when in reality we should have actually changed the term called it something else yeah fundamentals is a massive buzzword it's, a, it? buzzword. it's a buzzword it's weird what is fundamental like i, I mean i have a section i called, think it's like, so confusing from someone coming from the outside in confusing, and yeah. saying we're not starting with fundamentals yeah like what is we can't even agree upon what the fundamentals of the game are like what the fuck is that the fundamentals should be the actual fundamentals. Like we all agree upon no bullshit. Like this is the, what, it, this is what it is. And you start here, but that's not, that's not what it is. That's why I think the fundamentals of the game are all those other things, learning, like learning what all the champions do, learning the items, learning how minion XP works in gold. And then all that other stuff, like trading weight, they're just concepts. Concepts. You know, they're yeah. just, they're just important concepts, yeah. you know? So maybe it goes fundamentals, champ mastery, then concepts. Yeah, yeah. That, like, that would make way more sense like, in my mind. Like I always feel kind of embarrassed like if someone comes <laughs> yeah. to me from like another industry. Yeah. Like, this is the fundamentals, I... but don't start there. Don't start <laughs> the fundamentals. <laughs> it's weird. It doesn't make so much sense, does it? <laughs> Something to think about. All right. Our next question here comes from, and there's no name here. The title of this email is Coherent Question About LOL and Life. Hello, BBC. I was watching the video, uh, one of your podcasts, Why You Feel Hopeless in Your Climb. And the crux of the issue was doing everything but not getting results. I see this then and again on your channel. And so I find myself asking the question, what the fuck am I doing? Been watching BBC or, and Coach Curtis for two years now, but I've never seen anyone talk about how to do the hard work other than to get down to the nitty gritty and do the hard thing. After all these podcasts, I've come to realize that I've been like this all my life. The bare minimum. That's how I live my life. And I have no idea how to change that. In school, all I cared about was an, an accepted grade. My parents never had any expectations because they sucked at school, so I never cared. 
The same is true now for gaming as well. I never cared about going pro. Maybe I wanted it, but I just played to be better than other people. I got to Global Elite in CSGO. I got a top 100 placement in a Fortnite tournament among the best players in Europe. I got to a Mortal 3 in Valorant. I can't comprehend now the fact that I had the audacity to believe I could be among the great players without doing any of the work in League. I find myself now in terms of mate of gaming in league um, played for four to six years, something be masters since season 12 peak 300 LP in season 13 feel like a sham watching Curtis's videos much like my real life. I just do the bare minimum. I just play the game. I want to reach challenger, but I can't VOD review. I try to VOD review and I get bored out of my mind. I try to do three blocks, but end up playing more or less depending on my mood. I have periods where I think about the comps and skirmishing, but most of the time I end up just ego and thinking in I'll win because I'm better. I end up just watching your podcast to make myself feel better and motivated. Like I'm some sort of saint for thinking about my 2v2 before the game starts. I understand it's a very broad question and difficult to answer, but how do I actually get off my ass and do the work? Am I hopeless in the opposite sense of doing everything but not getting results? Sure, for me, it might work better in gaming than that guy, but only because I've been a gamer since birth. But that stops now at this master's roadblock. Will I be useless my entire life? Will I end up a lazy deadbeat? How do I stop taking the easy way? These questions plague my mind and I'm at a loss. Wow, what a great question. It's so funny when he's like beginning this, it sounds like he's like, it sounded like he was like a gold player or like a mm. silver player. I and mean, he's like, oh, like I'm master. I've been top ranks mm. in all these games, which again, gaming history, gaming history, right? He's played kids, kids, Game. games since a kid, but he's at a level, it seems where he's not satisfied with where he's at and he's not pushing himself whatsoever. And that can happen in yeah. anyone in any level of their, we talked about that before about what makes an expert last episode, mm. deliberate practice. If mm. you're not getting better, you're getting worse. Uh, to me, what it sounds like from the outside is that he's been so comfortable in his life because he felt like, well, in especially, you know, gaming, he's been so good at every game. Relative to probably everyone else he knows and his friends and stuff. No need to push. There's no need to push. He's he's if I've got you know global in that and top ranking this and top ranking that, then you know I've never had to actually push. And so he's relied on me just you know his gaming experience, gaming pedigree, if you will, to get results. And now he's at a point where okay, well his talent or his gaming experience or gaming background has got him to a point where he's plateaued. Now what? Now it's now the defense mechanism kicks in. You know, oh, that's good enough. You can relax. You don't need. You don't need to push. It's okay. Just cap out at master three hundred. You know, he's he's kind of got to that point. I feel like the reason he one of the reasons he doesn't want to push is that it's it's like a a um a habit. I think there's literally a habit of just doing the minimum and relying on talent, talent, yep. right? If you will. But I think there's that. I also think there's a, probably a fear of potentially failure and because he's never done that. He's never he's never actually pushed himself. I resonate so deeply with this email because that was exactly me. It was, I was played games from a, a young age. I was good at every game I'd played. And then, you know, you get to a point where you're like, fuck me, there are people that are better than me. Okay. Wow. I actually need to learn how to learn. Okay. I don't, I don't know how to learn. If I'm not good at something, I just do it's talent, right? This is, this is it. Like that guy's just a better gamer. Yeah. The better game sends you better. Yeah. What do I do? I just got to play more. Hopefully that I'm ready. And then you don't, you don't, that guy's just still better than you. Like, well, what the fuck? Then you're questioning your reality. You lose your confidence. You start to like, you, you know, become, you know, depressed or anxious or whatever. Like it starts to change the of events. So you know, the reality is that you got to learn how to learn. And, and in order to do that, you have to get incredibly uncomfortable and set a goal. You have to set a goal, an ambitious goal. That's where it starts. You have to set an ambitious goal that excites you. Something that genuinely motivates you. Something that you can like, you can actually like look forward to. It's like, I, w I want to achieve that. It doesn't have to be getting challenged or a league. It could be something else in your life, but it has to be one thing. I want to be able to bench press 100 kilos. I want to be able to, I want to get to challenger in league. I want to be able to run this far in this amount of time. Whatever the hell it is, you need to set an ambitious goal. That's number one. It seems like reading that email, it's very much about results focused or end game. Like it's, I think you need that though. Yeah, it's good. It's good. It's good. You need that. But like that's but then what, what? But he's not, he doesn't love the, he doesn't learn to learn how to learn the destination is the journey. You really got to really yeah. love the journey aspect of things. Otherwise you are going to beat yourself up. Yeah, but this is where I'm going to get more practical though. I agree. I, I think you learn to love the journey. You don't 
you don't love the journey of the star. Yeah, you have to learn. But that you earth. can't. That's like uh, Novak Djokovic. You were talking about that example of. Again, that's that's yeah, again. I think it's a bit tricky when you're only going for end result or then sending bang ambitious goals. It's like, why do I love the game? But you can't learn to love the process without having a goal. I don't think, in a way, I I, I don't. I, I think it's too theoretical for yeah, especially for I this agree, individual yeah. to be like, just play and learn the, pro- yeah, the I, process. Yeah, I just go around. I just love learning everything. It's not going like, to work. Well, yeah, you got to have, have some like yeah. Novak Djokovic wanted to be a great, amazing, win multiple Grand Slams. Yeah. But that wasn't the means, you know, that wasn't the it. It was like, okay, I want to I want to win Grand Slams. How do I do that? Okay, I've got to be a better tennis player. Okay, how do I be a better tennis player? Let's get specific. Diet, rate, exercise regime, how am, I, how am I practicing mindset? Like, you actually get into that. It's and like, then okay. learn to love that part. And then you learn to love that. So it's like, for him, I want to be a challenger. Let's say, hypothetically, he wants to be a, a challenger lead player. Okay, that's my goal. Okay, well, what well, what do I need to do? What What process do I need to follow? to be a challenger level league player. Like what, what do I, what, what, okay, well, even what skills do I need to develop? Okay, well, I gotta know my match loss better. Okay, I gotta, I gotta have better camera panning. Okay, I, I gotta be more, I gotta process more information. I gotta be better at my lull states. I gotta do all these things, right? It's like, okay, well then how do I do that? Why, well, I, I, even one of them, I gotta learn how to review, boom. And you, you, you start to actually work on these underlying things with the intention to be a challenger player. Now, every, for him, his challenge, I guarantee you, is going to be, he's going to get into it. And then you know what his defense mechanism is going to be? I'm bored. This sucks. Why am I doing this? It, he's going to have, it's going to be that whole, you know, when David Goggins talks about this, all the reasons why you shouldn't be doing what you're doing right now are going to come to your mind. All the demons. So it's like, you go out there, it's like, it's like the alarm goes off when David Goggins, like 4.30 in the morning. It's like, you, you, you said to yourself, you're going to go for a run. You, every single bit of voice is going to say, Every reason why you shouldn't go, oh, it's too cold. Oh, you don't need to. You ran yesterday. You're sore. Um, fuck it. You're already fit. You look good. Every reason is going to come there. Your job and what you need to do is get over that hurdle and literally just do it anyway. The, the, the do it anyway. And then by doing it anyway, you'd learn to love the process. And that's what that's how it works. But that's so fucking hard. It's really difficult. Especially for him he's because yeah. he has never done that. And that was so hard for me. It took me so long to shift my mindset to be, have a growth mindset because I didn't even know what it was to learn. I didn't know. I was scared to review. I was scared to like actually own my my weaknesses, but you have to brute force it. And then once you see the beauty of learning and you feel the learning and you feel the power of process, that then it becomes addictive. But it won't, you won't get addicted to the process or learn to love the process until you feel some semblance of positivity from it or get something from it. That's at least what I think. The no, that's the no bullshit practical thing. Yeah, in my experience, I'm going to talk about uh, a gym analogy, Curtis, mm. because the gym's sort of like a a new thing that I learned after mm. league, right? Learning to love the process of going to the gym, because that idea of like loving the gym, like pushing yourself to pay, it just doesn't make sense, or wouldn't make sense to me as a kid, right? Like you know, we I even like person. five years ago, if someone told you, you would just no, and now it's like. I go there, it's painful, it's actually very difficult, but you get addicted to that feeling. It's hard to, it's hard to describe how it does. You just feel like a better person, you just feel better. Is it just like, you know that the long term... It's investing in yourself. It's investing in yourself in the long term. It's, addic- it's addictive to invest in yourself. You know you're doing something that's better for you in the long run. Yeah. And you feel better doing it. Like just physically, mentally. I think you can't even, it's hard to articulate why gym's addictive because it's... Maybe the physical aspects of gym isn't the same as like other things. Yeah. I don't know. I think the biological stuff, yeah. minds and stuff. I guess maybe it's just, it's actually easier to get addicted to, to that sort of stuff. For sure. Rather than like, because that's like a, you know, getting stronger and stuff that feels great. But like, we're not designed to be professional video game players from all the evolution. You know what I mean? So that's like, you got to push yourself really much harder in that. So maybe it's a bad analogy. It's like mental, like I think pushing yourself mentally, mentally harder than pushing pushing yourself physically. physically. Yeah. In, in my experience, I, mean, I think this maybe differs for different personality types. I know people that can easily push themselves physically and and also the other way around. You know, like it, it just depends on personality mm. type. But I, I would say for us, I think we can safely agree that pushing yourself physically is easier for us, I would say, than mentally. Would you agree? But I guess they're both combined though, aren't both they? Combined. Like physical is a mental You can't do well. one without the yeah. other. I agree. It's hard to push yourself mentally without any physical component. Yes, that's the you thing. You need to That's be able to work out. To like if you don't yeah. sleep and eat and don't work out. It's very hard to focus mentally. Yes. And have the discipline mentally, for sure. Um, That's why I think they're connected. They're 100% connected. 
But I, I, I really think that there is an element of discipline and there is an element of learning to love, learning to love the process, like Nathan said. And I think there's an element of like, you're going to have to overcome a lot of demons and a lot of bullshit to like actually like stick with it. And and you really got to set a goal and ambition. You got to set a goal that's exciting, but but you know what? It's ambitious. It's kind of scary. And and you got to know that you're not going to achieve it in a long, it's going to take time. It's got a lot of time. It's going to take a lot of effort and it's going to, you're going to get, you're going to face so much adversity. You're going to want to give up. You're going to want to like make an excuse as to why you shouldn't do it. You're going to, you're going to think that you, you're going to, you should quit. You're wasting time. Every reason why you shouldn't do it is going to come up. Just now you just got to, that's like the, the solo queue contract, if you will, but you got to prepare yourself for it. But if you can stick through that and actually achieve that goal, knowing that you followed a process and you've actually learnt shit and you've put your, you put your all in, all into it. You come it just out, takes that one time. That one time. You're going to come out that other side of that as such a better version of yourself. Yeah. Period. Fact. No bullshit. That's, that's the way it will work. And you will apply that to everything for the rest of your life in any endeavor, whether it's your professional life or your relationships or anything. I truly believe that. That's that's the fundamental message of the BBC. Yeah. Basic one of the fundamental messages. Fundamentals. The fundamentals are my favorite word. All right. That's it for today's episode then, everyone. Beautiful. Uh good work. Let's keep Let on. Let us know in the comments about Joy Cube. Yep. Let us know. We'll see you guys next week. <laughs>